I want to share with you this morning some remarkable thoughts that have appeared in a recent publication with the somewhat startling title, The Scandalous Gospel of Jesus Christ. The Scandalous Gospel of Jesus Christ. I bought the book because I felt that here was another secular attack on Christianity and its core, the gospel. But it was nothing of the sort. It was not an attack upon the gospel, the good news proclaimed by Jesus, not at all. Rather, it was an interesting introduction, reintroduction for me anyway, to the meaning and the challenge and the divine imperative of the gospel. The author, one of America's most prominent theologians, insists and I quote, the gospel can be easily lost in the Bible. Beware lest you lose the gospel in the Bible. <coughs> what did he mean? Well, in other words, the Bible and the Bible only can in many lives take precedence over the teaching of Jesus, over the gospel. And consequently, it can demand of us less than the gospel, while helping us at the same time to believe that we are indeed and in truth very religious men and women. But let's hear Dr. Holmes' sentence in its context. The gospel, he said, can be easily lost in the Bible. But it was not so with Jesus. For he found the Hebrew Bible, the only Bible he knew, to be the means of the gospel. And if you look carefully at what constituted his preaching, his uh, definition of gospel, we might be surprised to find how much the gospel is at odds with our conventional Christianity. It is very difficult, very difficult, of course, to preach the gospel without giving offense. Think of it. It is difficult to preach the gospel without giving offense. And the world has been filled with people perfectly capable of being offended. The last thing the faithful wish for is to be disturbed. Thus it is easy to favor the Bible over the gospel. For we can argue about the meaning of Bible stories and the Bible narrative. But the gospel, we can't argue about that. Either what Jesus said is true or it is not. No argument. Do unto others as ye would that they should do to you. If someone asks you to go one mile, go two. The gospel message is not easy to argue with. So then, so then I suggest this morning we should ask, what do we mean? What do we mean when we speak of the gospel? What does it mean for us as individuals? And what does it demand of us? We who claim to be disciples of the preacher of the gospel. Well, to start with, gospel simply means good news. Good news concerning God. Glad tidings of great joy concerning God and God's relationship with you and with me. And, far more importantly, God's relationship with all of his creation. It's good news concerning us, of course. And the initial response is great, wonderful, splendid. 
For you see, it says this gospel of Christ, this good news that he proclaimed, God loves you just as you are, not as you were yesterday, and not as you will be tomorrow, but as you are now. With all your faults, with all your failures, God loves you and cares for you. God is interested in you. God knows, loves, and cares for you. God is not some distant tribal deity. God is a God of love and mercy. A God who cares, even though at times that might seem very, very difficult to believe. Ah, but you may say, was not that what the Jews and those to whom Jesus preached, was that not what they did believe? Is that not what they understood? Is this not what people believe who believe in God at all? No, not at all, not at all, far from it. And that is what makes Christ's message a gospel message compelling, challenging, as well as comforting. That is why Jesus' preaching was not always welcome. And why it is easier for present-day followers of Christ to quote the Bible while ignoring the gospel. The good news, let's face it, was bad news to many in Jesus' days. So much so that at the beginning of his preaching, his fellow Jews nearly killed him. And at the end of his ministry, his contemporaries succeeded. One of the church's most distinguished teachers of theology always says to his students before they go out to preach, remember, remember, ladies and gentlemen, when you enter the ministry, your task and your duty and your obligation is to preach the gospel. Not, not the Bible. Don't forget. Don't forget, he says. And this, to many people, sounds shocking. But I can hear him still say, don't forget Jesus did not know the Bible as you know it. It wasn't printed. Jesus, he would say, was not a Christian. He was the deliverer of good news. Then, then he added the dilemma that people crave confirmation rather than confrontation in their preaching. But you must preach the gospel. I feel it an obligation at times to remind us of how badly Jesus' first sermon went, if you think about it. Let's therefore remind ourselves of that first great sermon preached by Jesus in a building, a synagogue, a house of God for the chosen people of God. Luke chapter 4 tells us at first the young preacher was hailed by his family and his friends. His reputation had gone before him. He was referred to as one who preached with authority and not as the scribes, and so they welcomed him into the synagogue, the synagogue where he had been brought up. And Jesus did what his fellow Jews must have been delighted with. He took the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament largely, and he opened the scriptures and he read from the book of the prophet Isaiah 
And then, when he sat down, as was the custom, he began to preach. He began to expound what he had said from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And then, then his preaching begins trouble. If you like, the preacher ceases preaching and starts meddling. And there's always trouble when you start meddling with the lives of those who hear. Jesus applied the truth of the text to the lives of those listening. And states without favor today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The difficulty begins and the crisis of application takes place. Were they pleased? Not at all. The reaction was swift and it was unhappy and violent. People do not like to hear what they do not like to hear. His friends, his family, would gladly have killed him to be dragged out of the synagogue and cast over the cliff by an angry congregation of your friends and neighbors is a pretty dramatic expression of disapproval. But in one of the the greatest bits of understatement in all scripture. Luke concludes this episode with the words of verse 30. Passing through the midst of them, he went his way, leaving behind him a very, very angry congregation. What was it we may ask that proved so offensive in Jesus' preaching as it is recorded in this account of his sermon in Nazareth. Well, it may well have been the arrogance of youth. Jesus was, after all, a young man of 30. And though he had acquired a reputation, he was still rather new among those who preached and taught. And it was the novelty, presumably, that contributed to his reputation. He was young which in a culture that cherished wisdom could be a liability. But in a crowd that is stimulated by novelty, youth can also be sweet. Youth, however, is not the issue. It is hard to think that Jesus' youth provoked the congregation's anger. What set off his hometown congregation was the notion that the application of scripture as Jesus made it in his sermon disconfirmed rather than affirmed their sense of themselves. Having credited the preacher with a natural authority to speak to them, they were now obliged to listen to some unpleasant home truths which this young itinerant preacher was saying. We know that at the beginning of his preaching that they heard him gladly. It says so in scripture, they heard him gladly. What gave offense, however, what gave offense was the notion that they, special as they were, God's chosen people, were not all that special. That annoyed them, and it would annoy you, and it would annoy me. God did not, said Christ, God did not confine his mercies simply to the Jews, his chosen people. The non-Jewish widow of Sarepta and Naaman the Syrian are held up as instances of God's generosity, God's love, God's understanding, held up as God's chosen too. What a shock to God's chosen people. People take offense 
Not so much with what Jesus claims about himself as with the claim that Jesus made about God. God was no tribal deity. Their good news must necessarily be bad news for someone. Otherwise, what's the point of being chosen and special? Jesus, if you like, offended the sensibilities of his hearers when he says that God is interested in people unlike themselves, such as the non-Jewish widow and the heathen Naaman. It was not the issue of Jesus' claims about himself, but rather his challenging the entitled identity of his hearers that drove them to fury. This is the sense of claim and defense that the writer Samuel Johnson put many years later in a wonderful hymn. Life of ages, richly poured, love of God unspent and free, flowing in the prophet's word and the people's liberty, Never was to chosen race that unstinted tide confined. Thine is every time and place, fountain sweet of heart and mind. Jesus sermon in Nazareth anticipated a famous little book by J.P. Phillips, which I read as a student, which I searched for all last evening and cannot find. The book was entitled, Your God is Too Small. What seemed to give great offense to the early Jews was the notion that God was bigger than their conception of him, more generous than they were, and that this fact was at the heart of their own scripture. It was at the heart of their own scripture. Jesus didn't make it up. It was there in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus reminded his fellow Jews that God was bigger than they were. And although he did not finish the sermon, Throughout the rest of his preaching and teaching as recorded in Luke and in the other accounts of the Gospel, the claim of a God bigger than those who worship him, more gracious, more generous, more hospitable than they are, is at the core of what Jesus calls the good news or the Gospel. And it ought to be good news for us. God is greater than we are. For we are we and need some deep revealing of trust and strength and calmness from above. The parables, Jesus' most effective teaching instruments, often place a generous God in contradistinction to a less than generous human being. The most famous parable of all, that of the prodigal son, has been restyled many times as the waiting father, since it is to the older brother and perhaps to most listeners that the father is generously incarnate, rushing out to welcome his estranged son and working to reconcile the elder brother to the new situation. Or oh, when you go home, read again the parable of the workers in the vineyard. What is implicit is not explicit. When these words are put into the mouth of the owner of the vineyard, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I and generous are you envious because I am generous thus speaks God to you and to me
I'm afraid that religious establishments tend to be terrified by the idea that God may know more about the salvation business than we do. Having won the truth our way, it is very difficult to believe that there might be another way or that anyone else may have found it. If the gospel is true, if it's truly good news, I tell you this, it has to be good news for everybody. For it is either an inclusive gospel or it is no gospel at all. When it comes to knowing everything, a respectful agnosticism is called for. I tell you, if God, the God we worship, is to be the God of all and not just a tribal deity, then God has made provisions, not simply for non-subscribing Presbyterians or Christians, but for all his creation. Philip was correct too often. Too often our God is too small. And that is why I love the hymn written by E. W. Faber. Think of the words. There is a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. That was at the heart of the gospel, and all oh, its implications are scandalous, for they must make you and me think and rethink again. We are not the only ones in creation. God is the creator of all. And if Christ is right, and I believe he is right, God loves me and you and all creation. What a demand that puts on you and me. Small wonder that the gospel is left better hand than acted on. Small wonder that the American writer could refer to it as the scandalous gospel which demands more of us than we are prepared to give. Dr. Jones tells how he was asked to preach at the church in Windsor Great Park. Her Majesty the Queen and the Queen Mother in her 101st year was there. And he was honoured by being asked to return to the lodge for lunch. He says the Queen Mother remarked on how excellent the sermon had been. Don't you agree? she asked. Which is a very difficult question, he points out, for an honest legend to answer. When the honest legend has been sitting in the pew. And then he said, Her Majesty looked at me and said, I do like a bit of good news on Sunday, don't you? But when I hear the good news, I am troubled. Amen.